Now we will talk about the, some of the chapter 12 material. This chapter is really focused on DNA and how it's organized into chromosomes. So first of all, there are basically three main types that we might see. The first is viral. Viruses themselves are not technically considered to be alive because they cannot replicate on their own. They need to hijack, the ho hijack host machinery in order to replicate. Viruses have a wide, wide variety of nuclear material types. They can be either single-stranded DNA, they can be double-stranded DNA, they could be single-stranded RNA, in which case they can either be the plus or minus strand, we'll talk more about that later, or they can be double-stranded RNA. No matter what type that they have, viral uh, material can often be very tightly packed into the virus. It has to be very, very space efficient. There's not a lot of room to carry excess material around. These genomes can be either circular or linear. Bacterial or prokaryotic DNA is going to be double-stranded DNA, and as we discussed previously, it is circular. There are some uh, DNA binding proteins Structurally, they are similar to histones, which we find in eukaryotic DNA. However, they don't have some of the same roles. They do not compact DNA down in the same way. Bacterial cells, prokaryotic cells, they just have much less DNA than eukaryotic cells do. Now, in eukaryotes, the DNA is going to be double-stranded and it is going to be linear chromosomes. We're also going to talk about nucleosomes. These are DNA plus proteins. These proteins are called histones. And this is really important for packaging the DNA so that it actually fits within a cell. Okay, so when we think about supercoiling, supercoiling in viruses and bacteria, many of them have circular genomes. So if you imagine this as a circular bacterial genome and you think about it twisting, okay, when you twist it enough, it can kind of twist up back upon itself. And this is really what we're talking about. It is somewhat packaged tightly, uh, and it's not just necessarily loose and diffuse. In eukaryotic DNA, histones play an incredibly important role. Histones are proteins. They contain large numbers or percentages of the amino acids lysine and arginine. And the reason why it contains these in particular is because these have a positive charge to them. Remember that DNA has a negative charge. Specifically, the phosphate groups in the backbone contain the negative charge. And so this allows an attraction then between the positively charged histone proteins and the negatively charged DNA molecules. In general, we find a group of about his, eight histones with about 200 base pairs of DNA. This is actually found in two groups of four histones for the total of the eight, or the octet. The point of them, or the, one of the important points that they make, is that they help to condense an enormous amount of information into a very small area. We're talking about three billion base pairs of DNA into a nucleus, which is only typically five to ten micrometers in diameter. So if we were to look at this a little bit more closely, here we have our DNA. Uh, remember the diameter is about 2 nanometers or 20 angstroms. And we can see the histones associated with the DNA. If you're to zoom in and look at that, you can see the histone octamer, or 8 histones here, plus about 147 base pairs of DNA. They tend to have a little spacer region here. So um, in total, in average, they're about more closer to 200 base pairs. Once you wind up all of these, you'll have these looped domains, and you can see what they're going to look like here. You'll have this octet, and octet, octet, and they're all going to be looped around one another. As this gets looped further and further, we're going to have actual chromatin fibers. And if you were to look at this all together, then we have two sister chromatids. And this is what the chromosomes would look like during metaphase, where these chromosomes are duplicated. Although DNA is tightly packaged up when it is in this chromatin in association with the different histones, DNA needs to be accessible for replication and for transcription. Therefore, chromatin has to be able to relax this compact structure and be able to expose regions of DNA to different regulatory proteins. 
Also, this process needs to be able to be reversed during periods of inactivity so that you can package it up, especially when it's not needed. So when we're looking at this, the histone tails are not packed. They're typically unstructured. And what we're talking about tails is we're talking about a region of the histones that's not tucked in within the rest of the protein. These tails can be modified and these modifications are incredibly important to genetic function. And we're actually just finding out more and more how important these modifications are. We'll talk more about this in chapter 17 where we talk about epigenetics. Uh, but some of the important ones, first of all, acetylation. Uh, this is an addition of an acetyl group to lysine. What this does is it neutralizes lysine's positive charge so that you're going to have more of a neutral charge at this location. In methylation, uh, what you have is addition of a methyl group to arginine or lysine, and this can have either a positive or a negative effect on gene expression. It just depends on where it is and how it's acting. And then lastly, phosphorylation is addition of a phosphate group to serine or histidine. This will result in a negative charge for this particular region. There are two types of chromatin that we can find. The first is euchromatin. Euchromatin is uncoiled and it is genetically active. Heterochromatin, in contrast, are condensed areas and they are going to be inactive, genetically inactive. And the reason for this is because either they lack genes themselves or they contain genes that tend to be repressed. So two examples of heterochromatin and where they're going to be lacking genes is in the telomeres and in centromeres. Remember we just talked about telomeres. The role of a telomere is to maintain chromosome integrity. There are no genes that are going to be located within this region. Additionally, centromeres are going to be found uh, at the center of the chromosome. And this is going to be where the two sister chromatids attach to one another. The centromeres are involved in chromosome movement and there are very few, if any, genes that are happen to be found in this particular location. Sometimes chromosomes uh, can be stained in several different ways and we call this chromosome banding. This is used when you're physically looking at chromosomes under the microscope and you want to be able to differentiate regions along the mitotic chromosome. If you remember looking at different types of karyotypes, uh, and the different banding patterns that you see, the, basically the different stripes in the chromosome, you're looking at chromosome banding. And the unique banding pattern that we see allows the distinction of identical size chromosomes and centromere placement. So even though two chromosomes may look similar if you're looking at them under the microscope, and it may be difficult to, de tell, to determine the difference between them, once they have the banding pattern, and once you're able to locate the centromere, it now may be much more easy to differentiate between these. And this becomes really important when you're doing things like karyotyping or trying to see someone's genetic background. If you want to know if they have an extra chromosome 16 or 17, it might make a big difference. Uh, and so it allows different homologs to be distinguished from one another. It also allows you to determine which segments might be translocated. Say you have part of a chromosome break off and attached to a different chromosome. You can determine that by looking at the differences that you see in the chromosome banding pattern. So the two main types of banding that are used are C banding. C banding is going to be staining the centromeres and you can see here all the dark spots. This is going to be the location of the centromeres and this is again where the sister chromatids are going to be typically attached to one another. During G banding you can see this is going to give it the characteristic stripes that we see when we're performing a normal karyotype. If you were just looking at these chromosomes, say chromosome 14, 15, 16, they all look very similar to one another and it can be very difficult to differentiate between these. However, once you have this staining pattern, you can see, for example, in chromosome 14, there seems to be a, a large blank space here before the dark band. Uh, chromosome 15 and chromosome 16 are going to show some different patterns from that. 